the Monday after the night before, how does it feel? Um, a lot more relaxing than it was this time last week. But uh, <laughs> no, it's gone very well. I mean, you know, we had a we had a sellout. We had a lot of very very happy people. Teams were happy, and then you know, to top it all off, I think one of the best races of the season. So more, that, more relaxed. The quality of the race is the icing on the cake, of course, complete variable. But yes. that will have an impact. I would guess on the future now. I think so because you know at the end of it all people they're spending a lot of money to come here. They're staying here for a couple of days. They 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 they're enjoying the festival atmosphere we have, but they still want to see a good race and I think that's 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 the center of the activity obviously over the Formula 1 weekend. So being able to actually have a race like we had yesterday just fantastic and I think it has an impact. And there's a bit of a folklore element with Kimi winning, it's different from Vettel winning or even Alonso winning, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the smile on my face tells it all. I mean, I'm a big Kimi fan, I always have been. Um, I think to see him win a race, and especially here, you know, after coming back, it's, it's just fantastic. And he's just such a character, such a talented driver, obviously, and, and naturally, naturally quick. Uh, I just think it's great for the sport and, and, and clearly great for, for Eric and for uh, Lotus. Four short years ago, I followed him up these steps very near here, back into the hotel after the race, his last race for Ferrari out of yeah. Formula One. His shoulders were slumped. Yeah. I said, have a good time, Kimmy. What are you going to do next? He said, I just said, I don't know, and just walked off. Yeah, no, it is. And I think, you know, when, when he's still the same character, you know, and, and when I was working in F1 uh, with Toyota and we had a lot of contact, he, he you, you could sit down with Kimmy and just have a great, conversation about anything it could be snowmobiles it could be jet skis it could be his spare time in, in Finland and whatever else he was doing and just a really nice guy and you know can quite easily live with or without Formula One which I think is a, a nice situation for anybody of his category to be in yeah brilliant talking about Toyota can I just ask you to recall that time when you you knew nothing about this venture at yeah. all and you were at Toyota and Toyota mm -hmm. were gathering pace, gathering momentum, mm -hmm. obviously some issues yeah. and here you are now. Just tell us how that transition occurred for you. I think it was, you know, Toyota was a fantastic time for me. I mean, working with, with Ove Anderson obviously was a, you know, privilege and, and, and learned so much from that man over those years. Um, that was in Rally and Le Mans and obviously Formula One. To, to, to go into Formula One with Toyota was fantastic because it was a complete new venture. So it was an opportunity to learn and everything like that. Then, um, as, the, as the time was going on, I felt that I needed to do something else. Uh, there was some differences in opinion as to how I believe things should be going, as to how um, Toyota felt, and I respected that fully, uh, um, and, and felt that uh, you know, I needed to do something different. And um, I, 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 I was sitting down talking to, to Mr. E one day at, at one of the races, and just talking to him about different things and, and he raised his, his eyebrows as he does and said oh interesting he said I'll, I'll come back to you and basically it went from there and then the contact came uh, to, to come down here and talk to the guys and for me an amazing opportunity to go from you know a team's perspective and then go to the other side of the fence and becoming a promoter organizer and, and you know I, I just loved it and it's, it's been a, a great journey. Richard, I think it's fair to say that this is the facility to end all facilities. It, it lacks nothing. Uh, first of all, is that a correct I, I would say so. I mean, you know, the, the facility is amazing. Um, I think the location in Abu Dhabi is amazing because of the weather, because of ge geographical access, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, and I think the great thing now is it's become one of the Grand Prix that people want to come to. They want to come here because they want to see Abu Dhabi, they want to see Dubai, they want to see everything around the, 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 the city, there's amazing activation and I think we, in, in a very short time, we, we have in many ways created our own uh, identity in, in, in some of those great races that have been there for many, many years. So um, I think for me it's the best circuit in the world, of course I'm going to say that, but I, I think, you know, we, we may not see another circuit built to this specification in the future for various reasons because it was built in the boom times and so on mm. and, and it's just such a great occasion for people to come here and see it um, and, and watch people's faces as they come in whether it's for the Grand Prix or whether it's for a car launch or whether it's for a, a the World Economic Forum or whatever that we've had here they just come in and go oh my god I never thought it was going to be like this so it's a nice 
complement to our team. In a way, however, it's a bit of a problem for the other big facilities around the world because they're not Abu Dhabi and we've seen a couple of them go by the wayside. Austin is about to happen. Mm. So let me get your thoughts on Austin and the potential for that venue and the sort of things that you've gone through yes. that if you were asked to give us some advice, what would you say? Well, I, I think one of the great things, every circuit has its own unique features, whether mm. it's, you know, we've got our features, Spa has their features, and, and so has as Singapore, Montreal, Suzuka, you know, all of, the, all of those great circuits and, and many, many more. Um, and everybody has their unique features. I think we, we, have a, we have a unique feature in the sense of we've tried to combine as many of those, of, of those uh, qualities as possible. But, you know, if, if I look at, at uh, uh, Austin and I think it's, a, it's an amazing track. I just, I just love that track. It's the elevation changes. It's the triple apex, I believe, it, you know, looking at it on the, on the map and things like that. And I had the privilege to be there a couple of, of months ago passing through. And, and uh, the track itself is just, I, I believe the drivers are going to love it. Um, and then the facilities, I, I, you know, they've been well thought out in the sense of balancing the Formula One race, but then everybody else is going to come. So they've done deals with, with MotoGP, with, uh, uh, I believe, V8s and a few more like that. And I think they've put a lot of thought into how they've put that circuit together in terms of they've tarmac runoff areas, but followed by gravel traps so you can run the cars and the bikes. Um, they've, I think they have a very good balance of permanent and non-permanent facilities. Um, you know, we don't have the issue where we have uh, motorsport taking place out of trucks, but you know, because where of where we are, it's, they're nearly always flying in from somewhere. Yeah. But if you look at what what uh, Austin has done in terms of their their paddock, they can accommodate both, and I think that's a great one. So I, I think they put a lot of thought into it because. Circuits nowadays have changed in the sense that you, as you're designing, not even building, as you're designing your circuit, you need to be thinking about what you're going to do with it the day after the Grand Prix. That was going to be my next question, yeah. And I think that's the key, Peter, yeah. you know, and I think mm -hmm. there's not many circuits have, have done that for various different reasons, yeah. obviously, but I think that's now becoming the, the economic challenge is yeah. that Formula One is Formula One and it's an amazing, it's the pinnacle, it's all of those things. But at the end of the day, a circuit is a business. A circuit is about footfall and it's about a P&L. Mm -hmm. Now, the time to think about that is obviously in the design phase. And you can do it. And I think one of the circuits that seems to have got it right, you know, so far, and I wish them all the best, is Austin. And I think it will work. The one thing that makes Austin categorically different, however, from this facility is that this ultimately was or perhaps still is government backed underwritten. Austin is a private venture. Yes. I think only Austin, India and Silverstone yes. are probably the only yeah. three privately yes. owned Grand Prix on the calendar. Yeah. How are they going to make that circuit work economically between Grand Prix? I, I, I think, again, I think what they've done is that their approach has been very clever in the, in the way that they have put the circuit design together. Um, and, and in the sense of thinking about the day after. But I think every circuit now has to look at, and, and as, as you say, even, even in our situation where we are, where you know, the circuit has been built by the government and, and, and so on, but still the pressure is very, very high on us to, to break even. And, and we're looking like we'll actually break even as a, as a business in, in, within two years. Now that's, that, that's an amazing achievement for the team that's, that's, that's doing it and, and running it on a daily basis. And that's true car launches, driving school, all of those kind of things. And, and does that include a section on the P&L sheet which says benefit to the country with yes. tourism? And, yes. and of course that can be yes. accounted for in a number of ways, but I'm not in any way undermining yeah. what you're saying, but no, no, I mean, no, that's, no, a, that's I, uh, a very agree. important point that can be audited yeah. in, in, a, in a number well, of different that, ways. It, it's, it's quite interesting how that's been done here. That's been taken actually out of our P&L. We're not, we're not able to put that in because mm. obviously circuits can be very creative with those numbers and because mm. of that we've taken it out. So that's measured as a benefit for, for as you say, for Abu Dhabi mm. and for the UAE. But in terms of our bottom line, our P&L doesn't include that. So we're, we're basically, uh, it, it's revenue and cost. Right. Um, and that's what we're measured on. And it's I think things that's like 
title sponsorship of the race. Yes. It's yes. Uh, other revenues from merchandising. It's exactly. obviously ticket sales. Exactly. Food and beverage, all of the normal things, plus our year-round activity, which is all of those things. For example, last year we had the, the World Economic Forum here, which was thousands of people. We've had car launches for seven manufacturers so far. And, and they're, they're good business for us, mm. and they're bringing in good revenue. Um, and, and I think that it's the great thing is we're building a reputation for non-motorsport events. Our core competence is motorsport, and we will never forget yeah. that. But at the same time, for any circuit to be successful these days, it's about what business you build outside motorsport to create the income. So we have a lot of conferencing here. We have a lot of meetings and incentives going on. But it could be 10 people or it could be 5,000 people. We've catered for both. Um, and I think that's now starting to work for us. Yeah. But that's the only thing that circuits can do now, especially the privately built, you know, the, the cost of building this circuit, that has been taken out. Because otherwise, I mean, you'd be, you know, it, it would be spread over the next uh, 150 years or something like that. But can you look you put at a number that can, can we have? Well, it was it was it was put out there before as as a, as a 1.4 billion dollar project, um, and and I think we're extremely privileged to have been able to spend that money at that time. But that that we've moved on from those times, and I think that. But it, it, it sounds like a huge amount of money, but I think if you look at the facilities, it's all permanent, and that included a lot of the infrastructure on the island as well, not just building the circle. It was literally building the infrastructure to support the island at the time and the hotel. So when you start breaking it down, then it becomes a, a, an understandable number. A lot of hotels here, actually, just mentioning that. How many hotels have we got? Well, we've got six hotels on the island plus mm. the Yas Hotel, so seven in total, mm. about 2,500 rooms. Um, and then, obviously, in the city itself. The great thing is now there's something there for everybody. So you can stay on the island or you can stay in the city. Yeah. And I think the projection for the end of next year is about 25,000 hotel rooms in Abu Dhabi. And that's obviously to build the conferencing element of, right. of what our future is, effectively.